you stand together singing 21, love divine, all love excelling. Love divine, all love to excelling, joy of them to birth come down. Thank you. 
set me free. Thank you, Cortev. We appreciate that. Uh, we are so glad to be Americans, but there is something greater, and that is to be a Christian. That is one who has seen their sin before the righteous and holy God and embraced God's one and only solution for that sin, the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. Salvation relates to our souls, and God's going to continue to speak to us concerning that as we proceed, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege and opportunity that we have to open up the pages of your book. We know that we're standing on holy ground. We've had the opportunity and privilege of reveling in many contemplations of your grace for an extended period of time. But we're about to be reminded of the pinnacle of your grace, and that is the salvation of a soul. God, I'm praying for many things. Certainly praying for the salvation of those within the sound of our voice who have not yet embraced Christ as their own personal Savior. And I'm also praying that you would continue to stir the hearts of the saints in regard to proclaiming the good news. And then, God, again to the saints... I pray that our hearts would be stirred and that our lives would be brought more into conformity to the image of this one who loved us and gave himself for us. So to that end, I pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our study in Titus continues. I am reminding you that the great apostle Paul in chapter 3, verses 4 through 8 is seeking to re-impress us with God's grace God's unmerited favor toward us, especially as it pertains to our salvation. Uh, you know full well that God expresses his grace in a multitude of ways. Many of those expressions are very practical and very physical. Things like his sending rain to water the earth and you and I waking up this morning and actually having the physical breath of life. It is why you are here, and it is actually a measure of God's grace to you and me. But the pinnacle of God's grace, grace's fullest expression, is found in the salvation of a soul. Where a sinner, we all are, Romans 3.23, seizes sin and turns to and embraces God's one and only solution for that sin, namely Christ. Christ crucified, buried, risen, and coming again. I have to tell you, and forgive me for being personal with you, but uh, God reminded me of the blessed simplicity of the gospel this past week when a tiny little uh, girl not quite five, who is very special to me, climbed up in my lap and said, Papa, Jesus is my Savior. Her mom said that she had just that uh, morning during devotions prayed to receive Christ. She's young. Mom and dad are going to be watching and uh, probably grandpa and grandma as well, looking for confirmation that the decision was genuine, but remember that it was Christ himself in regard to salvation that said, you either need to be a child or you need to become like one. And you better see this the necessity of us setting aside our pride and our prideful 
self-sufficiency and our prideful, so-called sophisticated thinking and humbly receiving God's one and only solution for your sin, the Lord Jesus Christ. I remind you that it really is as simple as ABC. A, admit that you're a sinner. We all are, Romans 3.23. B, believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He actually took your place. He actually bore the penalty of your sin. And C, and there's a number of C words, but I like this, call. Romans 10.13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call out of your need on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, receiving him as your own personal Savior, and you will be wonderfully and miraculously saved. Remember, God not only created you, but he seeks you out, and he desires to save, and will do so when you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the most marvelous and multifaceted miracle in all the world. The salvation of a soul. Some of you would be interested in this. I have an article that I've had since 1978. You old timers will appreciate this. I used to receive the, the, good news, um, the good news broadcaster. Did I say that right? Yeah, good, good news broadcaster. I can tell that nobody knows what I'm talking about at all. It, yeah, it used, to be, it used to be called good news broadcaster. I did have that right, and it's produced by Back to the Bible. Uh, this article became very special to me. I, I now know, and and I'll chit-chat with you about it for just a few moments, that it's just a very broad overview. But the article is entitled, Salvation's 33 Blessings. I have to read the opening paragraph to you. It's by Louis uh, Sperry Schaefer, the first president of Dallas Theological Seminary. Did you know that 33 things happen to you at the moment you become a believer in Jesus Christ? Uh, Schaefer listed these benefits of salvation in his Systematic Theology, Volume 3. These points, along with brief explanations, give the born-again Christian a better understanding of the work of grace accomplished in his life, as well as a greater appreciation of his new life. We're going to be spending all of eternity exploring the significance and implications of your salvation. And mine, in Christ, it's that spectacular. It's that wonderful. It's that miraculous. And as I read through the list, and it's valuable to me, that's why I've kept it for all of these many years, and I've referenced it many, many times. But the more I read it, the more I'm convinced that it's very broad, that if you want a little bit more accurate number, you ought not to say salvation's 33 blessings, but probably salvation's 333 blessings when you break down all of the various beautiful component parts of God's grace, which he's showered on you in saving you, you stand amazed at this great, the greatest miracle, the salvation of a soul the transformation of a life. Again, Paul in these precious verses here in Titus is pulling the curtain back and he allows us to see something that we wouldn't normally see. Most of the aspects of the miracle that has already unfolded in the heart and lives of those who, of you who have put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you, you did not see with the natural eye. It takes a revelation from God. And that's what Paul's doing. That's why we're so excited. I, that, that's why you can hardly contain yourself. That's why you're having trouble sitting. Because the more that we walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and the more that we explore God through his word, the more we know of our blessed salvation and 
although it simply comes to us, yea, the blessed simplicity of the gospel, it is the greatest of miracles and has too many component parts even for us to count. And again, what's amazing in regard to that is much of the miracle that instantaneously, by the way, the miracle unfolds, and there's many things, obviously, in regard to um, Christian life and living that is ongoing and progressive, but Paul is, first of all, prompting us to recognize some of those things that took place instantaneously the very moment you put childlike faith and trust in Christ. I'm asking you again this morning, where are you going to go for such a thing? Who else has at their fingertips such a miracle? Who is it that has the power to actually transform a life? There's only one. And again, somewhat ironically, we don't even see most of what God did And so it requires revelation, and we have that. And again, forgive me for belaboring, but this this neat uh, picture of Paul pulling back the curtain and allowing us to see some things that we would not normally see. And, and, And although there is some feeling, there's a lot of the different aspects of God's work in your heart, which he performed instantaneously at the very moment that you put your faith and trust in Christ that you didn't even feel. God, keep talking to me about what you did. It's the greatest thing in life. Oh, there's some feeling we're glad for that, even though I'd have trouble identifying that in you this morning. There is some feeling... In fact, we noted last week, and glory, hallelujah, in regard to this, and I'm just giving you a hard time, don't pay attention to me about that. We noted last week that perhaps the greatest feeling in all of life is to be washed. I mean, not just physically, but more importantly, spiritually, where a man, a woman, a young person finally comes to grips with their sin and sees the gravity and the ugliness and the pervasiveness of the thing and begins to cry, is there any help? Is there anyone who can help me? Is there a deliverer? Is there a redeemer? Is there a savior? And oh, the joy that unfolded in your heart when you found him. There is one, only one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And oh, you put faith and trust in him, and although you didn't see all of the multifaceted aspects of the miracle, and although you didn't feel all the multifaceted aspects of the miracle, you felt some things, there's nothing like being confronted with your sin and brought to the point where the sin has gripped your heart and mind and then to know and yea to experience someone washing you, washing you, washing you of not only the sin itself but the guilt of the sin. So we feel some things, but interestingly so, We don't feel everything, and we certainly don't see everything. And that is certainly, that principle is certainly applicable to and and especially true of the part that the Holy Spirit of God plays in your and my salvation. Guess what? The Holy Spirit is spirit. Remember Christ in John 3? By the way, John 3, I ought to mention that now so that you just have that as a backdrop, especially those of you that are students of the word. You know, uh, Christ's teaching to Nicodemus, ye must be born again. And if you hang on to that terminology, it'll come around here in just a moment. But there Christ was talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God, the part that the Holy Spirit of God plays in the salvation of a soul. And he reminded Nick and us that the Spirit of God is like the wind. We don't see him. We only see the effects of his ministry. 
And so again, remarkably so, in regard to the greatest miracle in all of life, the salvation of a soul, not just the salvation of the soul out there, but the salvation of my soul and the salvation of your soul. But the vast majority of it we don't see with the human and natural eye, and much of it we don't even feel. So God continue to talk to me about my salvation. God, continue to show me what you have done. God, continue to pull the curtain back. So we're kind of hovering over the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. Again, the triune God is involved in saving you. It's always been that way from before the foundations of the world. God's perfect plan of salvation involving the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And in the same way in which we saw the triune God functioning with the physical creation of this universe, so too we see the triune God functioning in regard to your and my salvation, the salvation of a soul. And I know that God had to actually literally physically create you all so that you could be here, but even that doesn't hold a candle to the miracle that takes place when God saves a soul. When God transforms a life. And so much of that miracle, again, is at the hands of the Holy Spirit of God, the third personage of the Godhead. We talked last time about the Holy Spirit where he washes us, and we've referenced that already. But that's not all that he does. And so the list continues. And we are prompted this morning to think about the fact that he not only washes, but he also regenerates. The two things go hand in hand, as you can tell from our text. That's why the Apostle Paul combines these two things in verse 5 in the phrase, the, the washing of the regeneration. I like that. We don't talk like that. And I don't know how to talk when you're talking about the grand and glorious and divine aspects of the miracle that's unfolded in your life. But we've not only been washed by the Holy Spirit of God, we've also been regenerated. In the washing, he takes something away. He removes our sin and its guilt, glory, hallelujah. And in the regeneration, he gives us something, namely the gift of eternal life. Where else are you going to go for the gift of eternal life? What store, what person, what organization, what religion is going to offer to you the gift of eternal life? Do you see this? This isn't religion. Please stop it. This is not religion. This is life. Who's going to give you life? It's Jesus Christ and Christ alone. The one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one else is even making the claim, let alone delivering. And you are now are here this morning because we have been delivered. We have been given life. We're here to testify. Not only that Jesus saves, but the Holy Spirit of God. He first washes and then he regenerates. He first of all takes away something. We're so very glad. Sin and its guilt, even the Feeling. Thank you, God, for caring even about our feelings. And then he gives us something, the gift of eternal life. I don't know that we'll ever fully appreciate it, even though if you've trusted Christ, you've come into possession of eternal life. Holy Spirit has indeed regenerated you. I don't know that we'll ever fully appreciate the gift. But you have to listen to yet another way in which the Bible describes you before you met Christ, your B.C. years. Ephesians 2, 1 says, you were, I was, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Oh, you were living and breathing biologically and physically, but you were dead spiritually. And when the Bible talks about spiritual deadness, it's emphasizing the fact that our sin very effectively separates us from God. We do not know God. Although he created us and although he loves us, we don't know him. Our sin 
not his, he had none. Our sin very effectively separates us from God, the God who created us. Simply put, we do not know, nor can we know God. We do not, nor can we have a personal relationship with the God who created us. But alas, good news. Because that God not only creates, he also seeks and saves. And he does so through his son, the one and only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, his death, burial, and resurrection. The Bible says that when you and I put our faith and trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit regenerates us. He breathes into us spiritual life. And all of a sudden, yea, instantaneously, we are brought to the place where we can have an intimate and personal relationship with the God who created us and loved us. Walking with God by faith now and seeing God in the perfect image of his perfect son, the Lord Jesus Christ, someday later, I believe soon, face to face in the glories of heaven. Where are you going to get it? Where are you going to get spiritual life? Who's going to save you? Who's died for you? Who's actually took your place? Who, who apart from Christ, has taken your place? Who, apart from Christ, has not only taken your place, but borne the penalty of your sin? Who is even capable of doing that, apart from the eternally begotten Son of God? The God-man, God actually taking on flesh. Where are you going to find eternal life? Only by trusting like a little girl or a little boy in the one and only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, saying yes to Jesus. Sinner, contemplate this. You walked in here, you're biologically alive. You walked in here spiritually dead. You can walk out spiritually alive in eternal possession of eternal life. Where are you going to go? Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And you quote with me John 3.16. Here we go. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting or eternal life. Where else are you going to go? Who's going to save you? Who's going to deliver you? And I will tell you this in regard to eternal life, and it was neat to see this this morning, even through the Sunday school hour. Christ's high priestly prayer in John 17, you come to verse 3, and he, he, he defines for us eternal life. And he says, this is eternal life, knowing the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. And we're back to the terminology that I've already used, that you have the privilege of having a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, now by faith. And then the day comes when you see him face to face because the Holy Spirit of God, at the moment you trusted Christ, breathed into you the gift of eternal life. If I can, in your mind's eye, for just a moment, take you back to John 3, we're not turning, where Christ said to Nicodemus, you must be born again, and where Nicodemus, rightfully so, from a human standpoint, was a little bit confused, how in the world can I enter again into my mother's womb and be born a second time? When Christ was teaching him what Paul is teaching us here this morning, that you and I need to be born again, we need to be born this time spiritually from above. You all have been born physically, that was out of your hands, but this one is in your hands. Will you be born again this morning? Well, Pastor Tom, how do I do that? By trusting Christ. Who is it that paves the way for 
um, me to receive this grand and glorious gift. It's the Holy Spirit of God. He really generates you. He, he breathes into you the gift of eternal life the very moment you trust Christ. That's what is meant by this somewhat popular terminology of being born again. Listen, don't listen to the world and this understanding and teachings of such concepts, but listen to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who actually used the word. And trust him today and be born again. Be born this time spiritually into the family of God, sins forgiven. You've heard this saying before, and it certainly is. carries weight born once die twice born twice die once born once die twice both physically and spiritually born twice both physically and spiritually and you only die once and then you look forward to spending all of eternity with your savior and your lord sinner Please, come to Jesus. He's the one and only Savior. And this multifaceted miracle will instantaneously unfold in your heart and life when you put your childlike faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to pray with me in just a moment, but before that, a quick word to the child of God. I have an interesting concluding thought for you. You're not turning there, but I'm taking you in your mind's eye back to 1 Timothy 6, 12, where having been given eternal life there, Paul commands Timothy and the saints to lay hold of eternal life. If I may, Tommy Till paraphrase, You've been given eternal life. You live like it. That's your word, child of God. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes with me for just a moment? I want to give you an opportunity this morning. You're here and you've not put your faith and trust in Christ. We have once again, actually God, once again, using the word of God and aided by the spirit of God, has made the blessed gospel in all its simplicity clear to you. starts with our sin that's why we talk about it say ah why do they talk about sin because because there's hope and help there really is a savior and only one and so it starts with sin the fact that we've broken god's law we've all lied cheated and anything else you want to name you've done it if not physically acted out certainly in your heart We all are sinners. And our sin very effectively separates us from God, not only in this life, which is why this life hasn't felt right to you, but worse in the life to come. Separated, can you imagine? Separated from the God who created you, loved you, sought you, and desired to save you. Separated for all of eternity because you refused his one and only solution for your sin. Please, I plead with you to pray to receive Christ as your Savior this morning. I repeat, it's as simple as ABC. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross for your sin and call on his name. Would you do that even now in the quietness of this moment? Would you pray something like this? Lord Lord Jesus, I've heard about you again today. I've been reminded of the fact that you're the one and only Savior for only you came to this earth. Only you lived a perfect life. Only you mounted Calvary. Only you suffered and died. Not for your own sins, you had none, but for the sins of the world, yea, for my sins. And only you, through your death, burial, and resurrection, offer, only you offers to me the forgiveness of sin and the gift of eternal life. And this morning, I'm calling on your name. I'm receiving you as my own personal Savior. Listen, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Listen, 
Simple instruction, nothing that will embarrass you. Before you leave this morning, if you prayed that prayer, please, before you leave this morning, there's a green card in the pew in front of you. Fill it out. Testify to me. Confess to me that you have received the Lord Jesus Christ, that you've prayed this prayer, inviting him into your heart and life. I would love to know. I'd love to be able to pray for you. Before you leave this morning, fill that card out. Leave it right in the pew. We'll pick it up for you or hand it to an usher. We make it as convenient as we possibly can. I'm reminding you this morning, this isn't religion. This is life. If you've prayed to receive Christ, please let us know. Child of God, join me in praying, not only for others who still need Christ, but join me in praying that the Lord would help us to really lay hold of eternal life. Oh, we've got it in its entirety. We possess it for all of eternity, but oh, that we would know it fully in our lives, that we would, having been given eternal life, that we would live like it. Heavenly Father, would you impress these things upon our hearts? I pray for those who perhaps have just prayed. I I, I thank you for grace I thank you that you not only created us, but you seek us out. And I thank you that you save us through your son when we put our faith and trust in him. And thank you that you continue to save God. We've seen it this week, and we are glad. Continue to do that, we plead. And for the saint, for the child of God, for those whose lives have already been transformed, oh God, that we would more and more live like what you have made us and given us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together, please, and let's sing the first, first and last verse, one and five of 282. Wounded for me, one and five. Wounded for me, wounded for me. There hath the cross, he was wounded for me. Gone my transgressions, and now I am free. All because Jesus was wounded for me. Coming for me, coming for me. One day to earth, he is coming for me. Then with what joy is dear, face I shall see. Oh, how I praise him. He's coming for me. I've asked Brother Bob Melvin to please close us in a word of prayer. Brother Bob. Our loving Father, we bow again into your presence and thank you, Lord, for coming again today to meet with us. We're so grateful and so thankful, Lord, for a pastor that rightly divides the word of truth, gives it straight. There is nobody in this building that can walk away today and say they have not heard the gospel. So, Lord, if you spoke to someone, we just uh, pray today that they would yield their heart and life to you. Dismiss us with your blessings and bring us back again tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.